Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast where we are rediscovering the ancient way. And you can always find us online 24-7 at pathtozion.com, on Facebook and um, all those places, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you find podcasts and information, entertainment, whatever we want to call it. Um, the endless, vast solar system of information. Um, find us there. Send us an email, won't you? Pat Design Podcast at gmail.com is the way to do it, or on our Facebook page, of course. We thank you for tuning in today. I apologize if it's a little bit smoky in here. Um, this is only the second episode we've recorded here in the brand new studio. I'm very excited. I keep forgetting that, that I can somewhat spontaneously just come down here and turn on the lights and all the equipment, shut the door. It's quiet. I'm all alone. And this stuff stays in here. It's incredible. Um, but yeah, this morning, today when you're watching this, it doesn't really much matter, but it's morning here right now, and it's a little bit smoky in here. We had some friends up from out of state come visit us for the weekend, and a dear brother of mine from down there brought us some frankincense. And so it might be a little bit smoky, hazy in here this morning. Um, I've had some of that burning um, on some coals in here in the studio this morning, and uh, I just love the smell of it. It's awesome. It's not really helping my minor cough that I've been having, um, but it smells awesome. And, uh, you know, some of you may say, oh, there's, there's that Joel again trying to be like he's living in the Old Testament. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If my life can, can be a, a pleasing aroma that ascends to the Father, it's this. It's this. is a living sacrifice. And some things in the air and some things going on, some things that I do contribute to the present reality that my life is. And so ease up a little bit if you're, if you're thinking that's crazy talk. Perhaps you think it's pretty awesome. I'll try to find out where he got it and let you know. If you're interested, you can ask us. Um, so today specifically, I want to talk about something that, that I mentioned. I first mentioned probably at least six weeks ago. Um, on the program. I don't remember what episode it was. I probably referenced it in a couple of, of, of episodes. But it's something that I referenced as what I just called the coffee cup principle. The cup principle. And what it was, was one morning while I was drinking my coffee, which is an everyday occurrence, of course, one of the highlights of my day. And I, this cup specifically that I use that's here in the studio with me today just kind of as silly as it is, I'm drinking out of it and I'm thinking through a whole lot of things about the body of Messiah and, and her complexities, her differences, and how just because of who I am, in some level I attract some, some friction, um, a little bit of pushback. It's very normal. It's okay. It's, it's, I'm not complaining at all. I'm just setting the table of what we're going to talk about and why. Um, but... If you watched the last episode, which was the first one recorded here in the studio, because again, I had taken almost a two-month hiatus um, from doing video podcasts and almost podcasts in their entirety. It's been very quiet. And <clears throat> I just woke up this morning and I told my wife, I said, something feels different in me today. Started yesterday evening. I had an evening for the most part by myself and just communing with the Father with some projects I was doing here at the house. And I just, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to try to burn up all this time talking about that this morning, but I just feel like uh, something shifted back on the tracks for me last night. Nothing of my own doing. I didn't do anything different. I didn't like, you know, I did, it, there's nothing I did different. Nothing. Just something with Holy Spirit doing a work in me that's always ongoing, our sanctification process into becoming the likeness of the Son. I just like, oh wait, I feel different. Not feelings, not emotions, but we have to describe these things somehow. So I'm using the word feeling. I was feeling, hmm, a familiarity in a good sense that I've just not had for a couple months. And, and so why I'm saying that is to kind of set up for what we're going to talk about today, which will probably be one somewhat lengthy part by the time I'm done talking. 
And that's okay. Watch it all if you want. Break it up into bite-sized portions. Whatever. But this cup principle that I mentioned again probably eight or ten weeks ago, I felt like it's for today. For me and for you. For the body of Messiah at large, something that would be good for us to just think about and filter everything that we do in our lives through, I think it would be very beneficial for us. So we're going to present some things today called the cup principle. Now, now we're going to look at a, a bunch of scriptures, but I, I kind of landed for the most part in Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm just going to read a few verses. We're going to talk about some things, and, and we're just going to place before you something to think about in regards to your heart's posture towards the body of Messiah and all of the complexities that she is, all of the components and parts that are wrapped up within individuals within the greater body. Because, friends, she is complex. You've got a brother over here that looks like this, talks like this, dresses like this, watches this, does this, believes this. And then you look over here, and you've got a brother that looks nothing at all like that guy over there. Literally. Nothing. Both, we could say many times, both know Messiah. Both have been born again, moved from death to life, regenerated. But from that point on, boy, oh boy, do they look different, right? And, and we're going to talk about why. We're going to talk about a bunch of reasons why you and I likely look very different, yet both boast in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. And kind of help us to gauge and step back if your personality is like me or if it's vastly different than mine, to possibly challenge us to rightly appropriate how we respond to what we see when, in fact, we look at the body of Messiah and the individual components within her and what we think towards them, what we do with one another. And so let's just go to the Word of God to help us to begin to understand what in the world we are supposed to do. How do we function together? And this cup principle, I believe, will help us to do that. So Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a, manny, a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And he goes to describe what that is. With all humility, with gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Now, love has a definition, and love looks like something. We, we're not going to be able to follow all these trails down off of this throughout this entire program today. We're just not going to do it. So we're going to take the whole, and we're going to to attempt to stick to that. Show forbearance, patience, <clears throat> excuse me, gentleness, humility, in love. Again, love cannot be. I have, I have had this conversation more times than I will ever be able to count. I feel like we're just supposed to love one another. We just love like Jesus loved. Well, friends, we have got to know how Jesus, Yeshua, loved. We've got to know what he called love. We've got to know what love is. I'm thinking of that song, I want to know what love is. <laughs> In this sense, a pure right sense, oh, Father, Yeshua Messiah, I want you to show me. Show me what in the world love is. Now, if you're my age and you grew up listening to the late 70s, early 80s music, you know that song. Okay, so let's get back to what matters. Verse 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope for your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to teach, excuse me, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. We've all received this gift of grace. Forgiveness, really, it's a lot of it's empowerment. It's a lot of things. Again, we can't cover all of this. But we've been given the same. The same amount of grace has been bestowed upon us through Yeshua Messiah. And so let's skip down to verse 17 and 18 for the sake of time. We're talking about until we all attain the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son, to a mature man. We have to just often confess and be willing to say, you know what, I'm just not mature. 
I am an immature man, oftentimes. And so, uh, verse 17 and 18, This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk, in futility of their mind. And I want to read a different version that's not in my NASB here. Um, and, and this is a, I like how this is um, stated. Of course, Gentiles, heathens, um, but there's been an identity shift of who they literally are in Yeshua, Israel, Yahweh's people, a, a shifting of, of lineage, bloodline, gene, genealogy. We talk about that all the time on the program. So it says, um, but don't live like that with their sterile, this is again a different version, with their sterile ways of thinking and vanity of their own mind. Their intelligent, which intelligence, which is understanding in their ways of thinking, how they uh, assess something that they look at, how they understand, how they gain understanding, has been shrouded in darkness, in understanding, in mind, in, in the, the, the text here in the Greek is talking about their eyes are covered, they're, they're, they're in darkness, they're shrouded, they're covered, and they are estranged on the outside, the life of God, because of the ignorance that is within them, which in turn comes from resisting Yahweh's will. Now, what's Yahweh's will? I'm not even touching that today. We talk about that enough. But listen, here's what I want to do. Friends, there are absolutes. There are absolutes. This word of God tells us what is and what is not, period, hands down. Now, now, there are a lot of discrepancies with all of the ridiculous translations that have been made, adaptations. Um, this verse used to say this, and, and there's no way to know for absolute certain in many cases with the New Testament absolutely for sure what the author wrote down when the ink went to the paper. This is a, this is a hot topic in Christianity. I know that. I understand it, and I get why. It's a, it's a rightful challenge, and it's hard for us. All we can really do is step back and say, yeah, there's, there is errancy in the Word of God that I have been given, that I have been given. If we can't honestly say that, we don't understand how the New Testament has been transcribed for eons to get to us, okay? Now, does well, what do we do then with the inerrant word, infallible word of Yahweh Elohim? Well, it is. It's pure, unadulterated when it was, in fact, penned by Holy Spirit through men. Yes, perfection. But, friend, what we have in our hands with the New Testament, to be specific, has been altered. And we have got to go back and study and study and study to find out what in the world is true. What was intended when that man, what, it, what, what in the world was Paul talking about? This man, Shaul, who never had a name change. What in, what in the world was Shaul talking about when here he says A and here he says Z? I don't get it. Well, we have to study. We have to give ourselves to figure out these mysterious texts that have just been told to, told to us that they mean this, when in fact they don't mean that at all. That's why we're told, instructed to, to study, to show ourselves approved. But there are absolutes, there is black and white, and many things in this walk, in this Word of God. And there are many things that are gray. It's kind of what I just alluded to. There's many things that are gray. I don't really know. I don't really understand. At the outset, that's always the case. And, and without going down here again, <clears throat> we talk a lot about food laws, Torah, who we are now in Yeshua Messiah, and, and like what he fulfilled and accomplished and not replaced and eradicated and all those differences in my level of maturity, which is very small towards it. I don't have a problem admitting that. But we talk about these things a lot, and I always go back to Peter when he was told to kill and eat the unclean animals, not unclean food now. As we always say, and it's always worth mentioning, there was never unclean food. There were animals for food. And there were unclean animals that were never intended to become your food. Simple, yet very profound. And so when Peter was told by the word of Yahweh Elohim to kill and eat an unclean animal, what does the word of God tell us? He was perplexed. I don't understand. 
This makes no sense. And so in the text, he sits down and he thinks about it. He's perplexed. He's troubled. It's in a previous episode. We'll link to it. Likewise, we could learn from that example. When we read a text that doesn't seem to make sense with the fullness of the Word of God from beginning to end, we have the problem. We have the problem. We lack understanding, and a lot of times it's our Gentileness that we just looked at in Ephesians chapter 4 that just taints our proper understanding of the Word of God. And here's the thing where we're going to go to, is you yourself individually may not have the present ability to rightly understand that. There are things in here in this Word of God that I read, that I study, that I just don't presently have the proper understanding to grasp. I don't have a problem admitting that. Now, let's just be fair and honest. A lot of people do. A lot of people cannot rightly just say, I don't know. Hey, brother, what do you think if you're doing this and this and this and saying this? What about Romans chapter 4? What about Ephesians 12? Sometimes, friend, listen, Christian, believer, follower of Yeshua Messiah, whether you're Messianic or Baptist or Free Will Baptist or, or Methodist, Catholic, I don't care in this sense. Sometime, just practice, right? Just practice. Have a dialogue with a brother. It's probably going to be online, but oh, maybe it would be in person. And When somebody asks you a question, just say, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I've been practicing that lately. Hey, uh, Joel, you talk a lot about uh, the perpetuity of the law and this, 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 and this. And uh, well, what about this? Pick up a pen and I'll do a little jab. <laughs> I'm practicing to say, you know what? I don't know. It's a good point, brother. I'm not sure. Can we study it or do you just want to poke me with it? You know, and that's really, <laughs> that's the deciding factor, is it not? Is Are we trying to arrive at truth or are we trying to just puff ourselves up to, to figure out who's right? Who's more educated according to the word of God? Because if that's our goal, we're out from the very beginning. I wrestle with that. I do. But I'm in this present moment of my life, I'm doing okay with that to just say, man, I've got no idea. I need to look into that more. I don't know. And that's okay. We're going to talk about that as well. But we all, this, this gray area, there's black and white in the Word of God, but a lot of times there's gray. A lot of times there's a, oh, man, I'm not sure. There's varying inter interpretations, doctrinal beliefs. Error. Again, let's just be honest. There is error. Some is innocent and some is blatant. Man, when you start going back and understanding like the when the canon started being formed around this man, Marcion, and, and all he's the first one to my understanding that like produced a canon. And and some endorsed him and followed him, and a lot of people tore him down and said he's a heretic and you know, he said, ironically, that the God of the Old Testament was not the God of the New. Hmm, seems like maybe his doctrine is, is won out, does it not? In, in majority thinking. It's interesting. There is error. Some men, some scribes now, people who sat down and looked at the ancient text now, the Greek text, and they said, you know, this is fact now. They're... they're, they're they're transcribing, okay? They're making copies because you can get on your computer, control P, 20 copies of the book of Acts, please. And so they had to be professionally is what they got to. But early on, there were a lot of uneducated scribes. Hey, hey, Jim, do you know how to read and write? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I did that once. Hey, brother, copy... <laughs> Copy Luke chapter 4 for me. Uh, got it. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's that word there? Ah, close enough. Seriously, now, this is historical. Look it up. Or, here's a guy. He's a little more educated. He knows what the scriptures say, and he does this. I'm not sure that that's really what Luke meant by that. I think it would be better if I changed this word to say 
this because then the reader reader will more rightly understand what Luke was saying because I know what he meant. Friends, I'm telling you, this is factual, and it does not take long to figure it out. That's why we've got to go back. I'm going to tell you, this isn't even mine. I'm borrowing this from a brother. This thing right here, look into this. i got to buy one soon for myself instead of just borrowing his. We've got to go back. We've got to go back and to the best that we can find out what this black and white word of God is to help us understand the gray areas. That's just one point of what we're going to talk about today. And actually, hey, we already are. But we individually are tremendously flawed. We're flawed individuals. We will never get to the fullness if we'll never get to the fullness period. We need to resolve that issue. We need to just settle ourselves to say, you know what? I'm not going to possess all truth. I'm not going to possess it all. It's okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's okay. It doesn't threaten my understanding. It doesn't threaten my relationship with the Father. It doesn't change who I am. But I'm not going to know it all. I'm not going to individually possess the fullness. I'm not. And that's okay. I will have one view and one vantage point in myself. One. There. Every one of us line up 20 Believers, followers of Yeshua, man, studiers of the Word of God. Every one of them individually is going to have one view, one vantage point, one personal opinion of a text. Now, I'm not saying they will allow the, the opinion to override what they already know the text to be meaning, but when we read something, there's no way around it because the, of Yahweh's creative design I have the ability to, to look at something and understand it a certain way. Maybe in a way you don't. I have, I have people tell me, you know, Joel, when you study, I don't, how did you stop on that word and start studying that? I don't know. It's how God made me. And maybe you do something, whether it's studying or just your function within the body of Messiah, that I don't do it like that. That's awesome. It's the plurality of the body. The one representation of the individual components of the whole. It's beautiful. But we can't assault one another. And that's what I want to start moving to, is what we do. How we handle any measure of truth that we possess and that we unearth. Now, number one, first and foremost, and we're going to jump off of notes. I've hardly even got anywhere, as usual. Maybe I am feeling myself again. We will know little. We will possess very small amounts of truth. And anything that has come to you or I, anything that has come to us, period, is a gift from the Father. It's Holy Spirit teaching us and training us in all things like the promise tells us. If I find anything in this Word of God, it's because He Himself has revealed it to me in my inner man, and has given me his spirit to illuminate it. And his breath comes and he breathes life into it. So that I have any kind of an illuminated understanding by the Holy Spirit now. Not by mental ascent. Not by a meditative, you know, spirit aura. Trust me, there's plenty of this stuff out there too. Nor is it just by strict line-by-line -line study in a concordance. It's the balance of the studying and the meditating. If you wrestle with that, reach out to us. Send me an email. That's one thing that I can do decent. Can't do much very well, but I do that. It's a gift from the Father. It's not my possession. It's nothing I've done. I'm not educated accordingly. And so, for example, I believe in grace. Without it, I would not know Yeshua. It's a gift, as we've already covered. It's a gift from Yeshua. I believe in faith. I believe that faith without doing something works is nothing. It's dead. It's of no use. I believe in that. I believe that the, Yah the law of Yahweh is intact today. I do. Post Yeshua in place today in the new covenant reality because it, it new covenant, is simply 
the, the eternal law of Yahweh Elohim written upon the hearts of men instead of on tablets of stone. It's not that complicated, really. I believe in that. And so here's some other things, and as I check my time here to see how long we've been talking, because this is actually going to have to be multiple parts. You know, I believe these things. Me, my individual makeup of who I am and where I am on my journey today. My pursuit of holiness has led me here. And it's accomplishing that in my life and in my household. I see it in my wife and in my son. I see the fruit of it on the tree. And the tree is small. The tree is young. So let's talk about a couple of these things and then we'll move on. We'll probably just begin another part of, and make this a series of the cup principle, which we have not even seen as of yet. The cup will appear, I promise. Um, <laughs> prophecy. I'm going to give you some things about how people differ, what we would define differently that are kind of crux issues, important weighty matters within the church. And these are just kind of, well, let's just call them this. These would be considered hot button issues within the church. Um, for example, and I'll read them. Um, there's a brother that I met weeks ago where I work. I think I've talked to him, talked to about him rather on the program before. And, and when I got to talking to him, he said, uh, do you believe in Jesus? And per normal, I said, well, it depends who, who Jesus is to you, friend. I don't know what, what do you think, who do you think Jesus is? It's a good place to start. <laughs> Instead of just, yes, amen, fist bump. Who's Jesus to you? Because I'm not going to agree that he's my Savior and Messiah if you think he's something he's not. So anyway, that dialogue is, is continuing. It's still ongoing whenever I see him. But I remember him saying we had a, the very first encounter we had was hours long. And the next time I saw him, he said, hey, brother, you're not such and such, are you? Naming a movement. <sighs> Hebrew roots. Would you consider yourself a Hebrew roots movement guy, Joel? <sighs> No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a movement guy. I'm not a denomination guy. I'm not a sect guy, except for the sect that, that Shaul was a part of, which is the ones who are the followers of the way, friend. I'm a follower of the Messiah, the best I know how to be, period. And that's enough. Everything else, man, listen to a year and a half, two years ago when I started talking about when we were getting baptized, immersed, mikvah, about all these things that we come at, come at, uh, being the body with. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to... Pharisaical, man. It's pharisaical. Well, if we really want to be the body, we have to do it like this. It, and what I was always saying then, that the Holy Spirit was just driving into me like one of those jackhammers on the side of the highway, was Joel is too small. It's too small. This is too small. This is too small. This is too small. Meaning what? All of man's laborious endeavors to become a unified people in their own way. Well, we do this. Well, we do that. Well, we wear this clothes. Well, we do this with our hair. Well, we wear these kind of shoes. And now I'm being ridiculous, but that's how ridiculous it is. Do we need to look like something? Yep, we do. Do we need to look different? Yes, we do. It's a whole nother issue. But what about our heart's intent? What about the unification of the heart? And I said this, and I'll read this text. I say this all the time. I learned years ago when we were venturing into a shared life with several families here where we live. Awesome season. The, the best season of my life. Hardest and best. Isn't that the way things go in, in the body? But me and another brother who were the closest, until we disagreed on a matter, until we found disagreement within our, our relationship, we never needed the unity of the Spirit. We never needed the unity of the Spirit. We had brotherly unity. We had brotherhood exchanges of, yep, yep, 
Green, what do you think? Green. And we cruised, man. It was awesome. We accomplished a million things, yes. But when we disagreed, oh, now, now we're moving from just topical brotherhood to we're needing the unity of the spirit. And man, it took our relationship to a whole nother level. I would say that's good for us to learn and to practice and be willing to practice through. Um, so let's bring this one to a close today. Just talk about some hot button issues and we're going to get to the old cup here in a minute. Some hot button issues, as I mentioned a moment ago. Prophecy. Some real issues with the church. Excuse me. The role of baptism. Ever talk about that with anybody? Well, baptism doesn't save you. Oh, I know. Didn't say it did. Well, she said it did. Okay, she believes that. Well, you sprinkle an infant. No, you dunk an infant. No, you don't do either one with an infant. Baptism brings you inclusion into a group. No, it doesn't. We don't see that in the scriptures. No, it doesn't. We don't see it in there. Well, let's do it anyway. You shouldn't do it. Okay. <laughs> Prophecy, I jumped right through that one because it's kind of like a touchy one for me. Some guy says, oh, oh, just a minute. The Lord's telling me something. Right now, I'm going to squint. I'm going to look like I've got gas real bad, and I'm just going to take a moment, and I'm going to... Speak to you the oracle, the oracle, the word of the Lord. <laughs> and then, and there's a bazillion people who, who just sit there, and, oh my gosh, this is about to be awesome. <laughs> oh, that, oh, I hate it. And then there's others who will laugh at that and say, that's just a dude really excited. Yeah, I tend to go to that one. But prophecy is alive. Prophecy is real. We're told in the scriptures that Yahweh himself does nothing without first declaring it to his prophets. Prophecy? Eh. Prophecy? Don't like, don't like. Um, the Lord's Supper. Communion. Man, you should take it every night. No, you shouldn't. Sacred. Only during a service where it's orderly and given to you by another man. No, not that way. Only during Passover. No, no. Not that way. Only when you're with your wife on a Wednesday that falls on the last Saturday of October when there's a full moon. I mean, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Communion, Lord's, prep, Lord's Supper, hot button issue. Israel's location. This was just several weeks ago. Well, I watched a documentary that says Israel is down here. That's impossible. No way, no how. I won't even tolerate the thought. That's absurd. Israel's right there where it says on the map, friend. Where's Israel? Hmm. Could be tension. Could be a shift in relationship and openness and willingness to rightly, calmly engage with a brother. Cosmology, shape of the earth. You ever want to go there with somebody and find out if you have any real friendship and brotherhood? Start there. You'll get, you'll get written off faster than... A bolt of lightning coming out of a cloud and hitting the ground, friend. Hey, I've just got a question. Is is the globe earth that we've been told our whole life, is that is that biblically accurate? Uh, nice knowing you, friend. Bye. <laughs> it's almost that fast. Or, for the most part, people laugh and make it a joke and don't even want to talk about it because that just means you're an idiot. Cosmology. Shape of the earth. Big issue. Never knew that until recently. You don't even talk about it. You just get laughed at. And for the most part, it's for good reason because people look asinine when they're doing these videos. They look like idiots. I get it. Calendars. If you're in the Torah lifestyle, calendars, man. Oh, my gosh. When did you do Passover? Oh, Passover's tomorrow. What do you? What, of course it's tomorrow. When are you doing? Oh, I did Passover two weeks ago. Didn't you know about the barley? Oh, I didn't know about that. What would you see? Oh, well, at uh, barleywatch.com, man, they said the barley came in. Oh, dang. Well, we're doing it tomorrow. When's Bill doing it? Oh, he's. I think he said he's doing it in 30 days. 30 days? Calendars. Holy cow. Well, we follow the moon. We follow the sun. It can be, and often is, contention. Let's approach it in humility. In gentleness. 
kindness. That's what we're going to get to in just a moment. Tongues. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, cough. Tongues. Speaking in tongues real? Praying in the Spirit? Yes, but only when you do it just like that. It says with order. It says with interpreter. <coughs> no, that was just for that day. That was for that month. That was for Paul's life. When he says he did that, he didn't really do that. Oh, well, he was speaking Swahili. Oh, well, how do you know? Well, he had to be. Well, I heard him say something that sounded kind of like Spanish. Okay, must be tongues then because that's the only way tongues works. Well, what about groaning? What about uttering things, utterances in the, in the verbiage of utterances and groaning in the, in the Bible? Is that something where we're speaking in tongues, praying in the Spirit? No, can't be. Now, Jim Bob down there, he prays in tongues every five minutes. He's always babbling. What do we do? What do we do? Other than write everyone off in the whole body of Messiah and just lock ourselves up in a hole and close ourselves off from the entire world, friend, what do we do? We're going to find out with the cup principle in just a little bit. So, friend, let, let's just endeavor to decide we're going to endure alongside the brethren. We're going to talk about that, of course, read a bunch of scriptures about it. We need the full gospel, and guess what, friend? It's not found in you. The fullness of the word of God and truth, absolute truth, is not in you in its entirety, nor was it meant to be. We're going to talk about that in the next episode. And guess what? That's a relief, man. That's a relief. It should be a relief and an encouragement to you that you don't have to carry that weight. Holy Spirit is in me, and Holy Spirit is part of the Father, not a compartmentalized person, but part of the, the, the oneness of Yahweh Elohim, a representation of himself. <sighs> All truth. And I will need it. I'm reminded of that word Sophia in the Greek, man utterance and wisdom. And Yeshua said, guess what, friend? You're going to get it when and, and where you need it. Depend upon me. Walk in the Spirit. You'll get it then. Don't worry about getting it all together first on the front end. So this is the beginning of talking about the cup principle. We'll get to it. This is the Path to Zion podcast. We're rediscovering the ancient way. Find us at pathtozion.com on Facebook. Share these videos if you feel so compelled. Thank you again for everyone who's made this happen. I will just say this in closing. This equipment, all of it, and this entire studio that was more figures than I would like to talk about in expense, all paid for by people like you. Incredible. What a blessing. Thank you for watching. Send us an email again, pathdesignpodcast at gmail.com. We will see you right back here for part two of the cup principle right after this. Amen.